Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And um, so today I'm going to be talking about classification and retrieval, which are two very basic problems of machine learning and statistics. And I'll be talking about how some geometric ideas that originated in functional analysis, um, theory of computation, and uh, computational geometry can be used to overcome some fundamental hurdles in these problems. Okay, so let me begin by just defining these problems. Um, Retrieval is a very familiar problem in computational geometry. The setting over here is that you're given some very large collection of items, x1 through xn, from some space x. And this could be a space of images, a space of documents, a space of medical records, for example. Okay, so for example, you are given 10 million images, a database of, of these images. And then later, um, people come by with new images. And they say, oh, you know, I really like this picture. Can you find other pictures in your database that are just like this? Or can you find the closest matches in your database? Or a new patient arrives in the hospital and you say, okay, is there somebody in the, in the database that is very similar to this new patient? Okay. So uh, for this problem, the primary challenge is an algorithmic one. So one would like to be able to find the closest match amongst those 10 million images without actually going through all of them. Okay, and so this is a very classic problem of nearest neighbor search. In the classification problem, uh, again, you have a very large collection of items, uh, but this time each of them has got an associated label. Okay, so you have the 10 million images as before, but now they're labeled. This one's a cat, that one is a dog, this one's a giraffe, and so on. And now what you need to do is to learn a classification rule that takes any item in the set X, that takes any image, and then outputs a label for it. And hopefully this rule is something that has relatively low error. And the way it's going to be used is in the future, new items will be provided, and this rule will be used to label them. So here, the fundamental question is, um, is a statistical question, which is, how much data do you need in order to learn an, a good rule, a rule that has high accuracy? Okay, so these are two problems that seem rather different. One of them is, one of them has labels, one of them doesn't. In one of them, the central challenge seems to be algorithmic, whereas in the other one, we're really asking a statistical question. But the reason I wanted to put them together is that it turns out that they really suffer from very similar bottlenecks. And um, the same geometric ideas can be used to handle both of them. Okay? So in, in both of these problems, a fundamental bottleneck or a, a fundamental parameter that affects the complexity of these problems is the dimension of the data. And so let me just uh, specify what that, what that is exactly. Okay, so suppose we're collecting data on heart patients that are leaving a hospital because, uh, for example, we want to predict whether it's safe to let them go. So we collect various measurements, you know, age, weight, temperature, blood pressure, and so on. And each of these is a number. And if we have D of these measurements, then we string them together into a D-dimensional vector. And we'll just say, the dimension of the data is D. Okay, these are points in D-dimensional space. Now, uh, I, you know, it seems like we would want as much information as possible. So we should want to make D large. Okay, the more information, the, the, the better the retrieval, the better the classifier, and so on. But um, the, the problem really is that the algorithmic complexity of the retrieval problem and the statistical complexity of the classification problem actually seem to scale rather badly with dimension. And this is something that I'll make precise a little bit later. So we're in this sort of a strange situation where ideally we'd want the dimension to be large because of the information content. But at the same time, from both the algorithmic and the statistical viewpoint, we have uh, this inclination to try and actually keep them small. Okay, and um, so what I'll be talking about today is a particular way to conceptualize uh, and manage this problem. And, 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 and so what we'll be doing is that we'll say that um, this, this parameter D is actually a rather superficial way to measure the dimension of the data. Okay, it's the dimension, but it isn't really necessarily a reflection of the underlying degrees of freedom within the data. And often, the dimension is very large, but the underlying degrees of freedom are much smaller 
And that's something that we would like to think of more as being the intrinsic dimension of the data. And we'd like to formalize a notion that captures that kind of intrinsic dimension. And now we would like procedures for retrieval and classification whose complexity scales with that smaller number. Okay? So, um, so just as sort of a high level, what I'll be doing is first introducing a notion of intrinsic dimension, which in many cases will be much smaller than this apparent dimension, the superficial dimension, which is simply the number of coordinates. Okay? Um, then we'll talk a little bit about classification, and we'll look at some standard methods and data structures for classification. And it'll turn out that these really do depend on the apparent dimension. They don't adapt to this intrinsic dimension. However, there are ways to change them very slightly just by introducing a little bit of randomness that completely removes this dependence on the apparent dimension and makes them depend only on that intrinsic dimension. Okay? And this will lead to improved statistical rates of convergence for the classification problem. And then we'll see that something similar can be used for nearest neighbor search and will yield a, a state-of-the-art method. Okay, so this is the um, overview. And what I'll do is, therefore, to start by talking a little bit about this notion of intrinsic dimension. And I've been, I've been throwing around these terms like degrees of freedom, so I just wanted to give a couple of examples. Okay, so one example is a, is a speech signal, you know, so what exactly is that? Well, you know, so I'm talking and this is agitating the air molecules and, uh, you know, a wave reaches your ear and in your ear you have a very thin diaphragm that is wiggling in response to this sound. And the speech signal is literally the oscillation of that, of that diaphragm. So it's a, it's a one-dimensional time series. Now, the way in which we would normally um, store this in a computer for processing is to look at little windows of the signal, say windows of 25 milliseconds. And so we look at a window, and we have this continuous um, time series in there. And then we apply many filters. Okay? And each filter gives us a real number. So this is like doing a Fourier analysis. So each filter gives us a real number. And the more filters we apply, the higher dimensional the representation we get. Okay, so we can make the representation as high dimensional as we want. But at the end of the day, the sound was produced by a physical apparatus, my vocal tract. And that's a physical device with a limited number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so you can make the apparent dimension D as large as you like, but the degrees of freedom, the inherent degrees of freedom in the system are really much smaller. Okay? So, um, so how would we formalize this notion of degrees of freedom in the way that uh, this has traditionally been done in the machine learning world is to think of this as a manifold learning problem. To say that we have data that's in some high dimensional space, but it doesn't fill up the space. The data actually lies close to a low dimensional manifold, a manifold of some dimension D0 that's much, much smaller than D. Okay? And, um, and we saw the speech example. Let me give you another quick example. Okay? And this is from motion capture. So if you want to do realistic animations, uh, you know, for example, of that Gollum character from Lord of the Rings and so on, you know, one way in which you can do this is you put a, um, you put a special suit on a, on a human actor, and then the human um, uh, behaves in the appropriate manner, and the suit has many markers on it, and you measure the locations of, this, of these markers as the, as the actor is moving around. Now, each marker has got a three-dimensional location, so if there are m markers, you get 3m numbers. So it's 3m dimensional. And by making m large, you can make the dimension as large as you like. However, the positions of these markers are not independent. They're functions of the joint angles in the body. And so the degrees of freedom once more are limited. The dependence on the joint angles is not linear. You know, there are sines and cosines involved. So again, it's this sort of manifold structure. Okay, and so there are many examples like this where either physical or geometric constraints suggest that the data would actually lie close to this sort of low dimensional manifold. And the approach that's typically been taken is to, is to try and identify the manifold. It's to say, okay, we have a lot of data points and we, and we think they lie close to a low dimensional manifold. Let's try to find that manifold. Let's try to identify it. Let's try to come up with a global coordinate system for it. Okay. Uh, and then use that to reduce the dimension. Okay? Now, that's not the approach I'll be talking about today because um, it's actually a very challenging thing to do. 
So I'll be talking about something that's uh, much simpler, that doesn't try to um, identify the low dimensional structure, but just automatically adapt to it without actually figuring out what it is. Okay? So this is one type of small degrees of freedom, uh, but there are many other ways in which data could have intrinsic low dimension. Let me give you another example. Another example is sparse data, okay? And this is what we see, for example, in rep representing documents. Now, a document is a sequence of words. How do you convert that into a vector of fixed dimension? So um, perhaps the most common way of doing this is by a bag of words model. So um, you choose your 10,000 favorite words, okay? Maybe despair, evil, happiness, foolishness, and so on. And you represent a document by this 10,000 dimensional vector where you simply count how many times each of those words occurs in the document. Okay, so you say, okay, in this document, despair occurs once, evil occurs twice, happiness occurs zero times, and so on. Okay, and the document now gets mapped into this 10,000 dimensional vector or whatever the dimension is. So this is, again, a very high dimensional representation. But for most documents, almost the entire vector is zero. Okay, so if you have a document that has 100 words in it, you have this 10,000 dimensional representation, but at most 100 of the entries are, are non-zero. So what is the intrinsic dimension? Is it 10,000 or is it 100? And we'd like it to be 100, needless to say. Okay, so, um, so sort of the high-level point is that there are many uh, widely occurring types of low intrinsic dimension, and what we would like is a notion of dimensionality that captures um, all these different cases, okay? And then we would like to come up with algorithms for classification and for retrieval whose complexity, algorithmic or statistical complexity, is really governed by this intrinsic dimension uh, rather, by, rather than by the apparent very high dimension, okay? Um, so what is this notion of dimension that we'll use? Uh, well, we are still looking for one, but um, along the way, we have been using a notion that really goes quite a distance um, and that was introduced um, in the theoretical computer science literature, and this is uh, the doubling dimension. Okay, so this was introduced um, by Gupta, Krautgamer, and Lee, but, but really it's, um, it's, it's based on uh, it's in, based on notions from the early 80s uh, by Patrice Aswar. And what this, um, so, so here's the notion of dimension, okay? So you have some set in RD, okay? Um, could be finite or infinite, it doesn't matter, okay? And you say that its intrinsic dimension, its doubling dimension is D0 if it has the following property. If you look at any ball in space, and you look at the points that fall in the ball, you can cover them by two to the d0 balls of half the radius, okay? So let me give you some examples, okay? So let's say, for example, that your data set is in very high dimension, but it's a line, okay? So now, if you pick any ball in space, the part of the line that lies inside the ball, this line segment, can be covered by two balls of half the radius, okay? And so the doubling dimension in this case is one. And for the same, and for a very similar reason, any k-dimensional flat, any k-dimensional affine subspace has a doubling dimension that is, you know, 3k, for example, okay? What about manifolds? Well, um, under a curvature condition, manifolds are locally almost flat in uh, neighborhoods given by that curvature. Um, and so locally satisfy this property of having a very low doubling dimension. What about sparse sets? Well, if you have a set in which each point has just k non-zero coordinates, the set lies in the union of these k flats, lies in a union of at most d choose k k flats, and therefore, once again, it has low doubling dimension. So this is a nice notion of dimensionality that covers at least some of the cases we've been looking at. It also has this nice property that it holds for subsets as well. Okay, so if a set has low doubling dimension, so there's subsets of it. And so this is the notion of dimension that we'll be working with. Um, and so let's start with classification. Um, and so um, our goal, once again, is to come up with 
um, classification systems now whose complexity depends only on this intrinsic dimension, only on the doubling dimension, rather than whatever, the dim whatever dimension the data seem to lie in. Okay. And we'll be talking about non-parametric classification. Okay, so the distinction here is so in a classification problem, you have to come up with a rule that separates the different labels from each other. In this example, there are just two labels, pluses, pluses and minuses. And you need to come up with a, a boundary or a rule that separates the pluses from the minuses. A very common practice is to assume that the boundary has a very sim simple functional form. For example, that the boundary is linear. Okay, and that's what's being done on the right. Okay? Uh, what we'll be looking at is non-parametric classification, which is the case on the left, where you make no assumptions about the nature of the boundary. And the nice thing about these sort of methods is that you can fit any type of function with it. Okay? However, you pay for this rich representation, for this expressiveness, with a very bad curse of dimensionality. And um, this was formalized in the late 70s and early 80s by Charles Stone, okay? And so, um, so the question he looked at was the following. Suppose you have n data points, and you use those to build a non-parametric classifier, okay? Like the one on the left. What error would we expect that classifier to have on future data, okay? And what he showed is that in general, the error is gonna be like this. It's going to look like, uh, don't worry about the p, that's just a smoothness parameter for if the boundary is Lipschitz, that would be one. Um, but basically the error is going to look like n to the minus one over d. And what that, and that's actually very bad. What it means is that, for example, if you want to halve the error, you have to increase the amount of data by a factor of two to the d, okay, which is dreadful if D is large, um, say 100, okay? Um, in fact, if D is 200, you know, 2 to the D is already more than the number of atoms in the world, okay? So we would not expect that much data. So this is very bad. Um, th this is a very bad lower bound. And what we'd like to do is to see whether we can just convert that D to a D0, okay? That's what we'd like to do. We'd like to have classifiers that really depend just on the intrinsic dimension rather than this apparent dimension. And it'll turn out that this is actually extremely simple to do, okay? And to see um, how we do this, let's just look at a sort of a canonical, a prototypical way for doing uh, non-parametric classification. So um, a standard way of doing non-parametric classification is to take space and just divide it into little boxes. Okay, so you create all these little boxes and you make a prediction within each box. In this box, we're going to predict plus. In this box, we're going to predict minus and so on. How do you create this partition? Okay, a popular way of doing this is the KD tree, which was introduced by Bentley and um, also further studied by Friedman in the 70s. Okay, and what this does is you have your n data points in d-dimensional space. You put a box around them and now you pick a coordinate direction and you split at the median data value along that direction. So half the points go to the right, half the points go to the left, and then you recurse on the two halves, okay? And in this way, you get a hierarchical decomposition of space into these rectilinear cells. And you keep going, you keep breaking it up until each box contains um, at most a fixed number of points, say 100 points or 1,000 points, and then you stop, okay? Now, in order to classify a new point, you move it down the tree, see which box it lies in, and just return the majority label within that box. Okay, and that's a classifier right there, a non-parametric classifier. Now, this sort of classifier is known to be consistent. So as n goes to infinity, this recovers the true decision boundary no matter how crazy it looks. Okay, so this is definitely consistent. But what we really care about is the rate of convergence. And what governs the rate of convergence is the following. It's the speed at which the diameter of these cells shrinks as you go down the tree. Okay, so at the top of the tree, you have a cell. You have this big box. One level down, you have a slightly smaller box. Two levels down, you have a slightly smaller box. Three levels down, you have a slightly smaller box. And what, depend and what matters is how fast those diameters are shrinking 
as you go down the tree. That's what controls the rate of convergence. If those diameters are shrinking rapidly, then the rate of convergence is very fast. And if they're shrinking slowly, then the rate of convergence is slow. Okay? So how fast are they shrinking? And it turns out that they're shrinking painfully slow. Okay? And the way we'll formulate this is to say that how far do you have to go down the tree to halve the diameter? So initially you're in a big box. How many levels down do you need to go for that diameter to be halved? And in general, you need to go D levels down, which is really bad. So in order to half the diameter, you need to go D levels down, which means also multiplying the data by a factor of 2 to the D. Okay. So um, let's see an example of this. Okay. So here's an example of a very simple kind of data set where um, it lies in d-dimensional space, but the data is very sparse. Each point has only one non-zero coordinate. Okay? So every point has just one non-zero coordinate, and it's between minus 1 and plus 1. So the points lie along the coordinate axes. Okay? So it's a data set that lies along these coordinate axes. Okay? Um, and now let's build a KD tree on these. Okay, so the diameter of this data set is two. It's the distance from here to here. And now you start by picking a direction, say x1, and you split at the median along that direction. What is the diameter of the two halves? It's still two. You can imagine, uh, there's a little bit of tie breaking that's going on over here. So you can imagine that we add a tiny amount of noise to each point, okay? So the diameter is still two. You cut once more, the diameter is still two. And you, have, you just keep going and you have to do this d times in order to get the diameter down to one. Okay, so this is a very bad um, um, rate of decrease of diameter. And yet, this data set has low intrinsic dimension. It just lies along coordinate axes. It's a, it's a sparse data. It's a classic example of data that has low intrinsic dimension. Its intrinsic dimension is just log d. So this is a, a sort of a canonical way of building a non-parametric classifier we see why it's getting this 2 to the d rate of convergence. And it's also clear that it is not sensitive to intrinsic dimension. Even if data has very low intrinsic dimension, it still behaves according to the apparent dimension. Okay? But luckily, you can make a very small change to the data structure that makes it automatically adapt to the intrinsic dimension. And here's what you have to do. Instead of picking coordinate directions, you pick a direction at random from the unit sphere. Okay, so instead of picking a coordinate direction, just pick a random direction from the unit sphere. And instead of splitting exactly at the median, split at the median plus a small amount of noise. And um, we can make precise exactly how much noise that is. And if you do that, you get something that looks like this. Okay, so you start first by picking a random direction. You don't split exactly at the median, but a median plus a little bit of noise. And now you recurse on each side. Okay? If you do this, it turns out that you have the diameter every d0 log d0 levels. Okay? So all of a sudden, it doesn't depend on the apparent dimension anymore. And it adapts to the intrinsic dimension. It doesn't need to know what that intrinsic dimension is. It doesn't need to know what d0 is. If it's a manifold, it doesn't need to recover the manifold. But whatever that intrinsic dimension happens to be, it will adapt to it in the sense of having um, this much quicker rate of diameter decrease. And this immediately translates um, to a faster rate of convergence. So whereas previously it was n to the minus 1 over d, now it'd be n to the minus 1 over d0 log d0. Okay. So um, let me explain briefly why this is the case. Okay. This is rather strange. Uh, a random direction where instead of picking along coordinate, instead of picking coordinate directions, we're splitting along random directions. Why are random directions good? Um, so it's not that they are good. Random directions are not good, um, but they are unlikely to be disastrous. That's uh, so. They're, first of all, they're <coughs> unlikely to be really bad, and second of all, they behave in very predictable ways, and so. And, and that's what lets us do the analysis, okay? And so, and so let me explain how that goes, okay? So what happens when you pick a random direction and you project everything onto that direction? What, does, what happens to the data? And as we'll see, the, the data gets transformed in a way 
that can really be characterized quite precisely by using various concentration properties. Okay? So, when I say pick a random vector, I meant pick a, a random vector from the unit sphere in RD. That's almost exactly the same as picking it from a d-dimensional Gaussian, okay, whose variance has been changed slightly. Okay? This is also a spherically symmetric distribution. And if you draw a vector from this distribution, its length is very tightly concentrated around one. So you might have to renormalize slightly, but it's a, it's a very minuscule effect. Okay? So this is sort of the more convenient thing to work with. And then each point gets projected to u dot x. So let's see what happens to a single point. Okay? So let's say you just have one point, and you project it onto a random line. So you've taken u dot x. Well, u is a Gaussian. Any linear combination of Gaussians is a Gaussian, so the projection is distributed as a Gaussian. And so u dot x, the distribution of u dot, of u dot x is Gaussian with mean 0 and variance the length of x squared over d. And in particular, it means that the projection is concentrated within this one standard deviation or two standard deviations, however you want to take it. Okay. So the projection of this point looks rough, roughly like a uniform value in the range plus or minus 1, plus, plus or minus length of x divided by square root d. Okay? So the projection of a single point is, um, is very easy to understand. Now our data set, unfortunately, has a lot of points. Okay? And we certainly don't want to take a union bound over all of them. Um, there could be infinitely many points, okay? At no point, uh, we are not assuming anything is finite, okay? So what we want to know is, okay, the projection of one point is easy to understand, but what about the projection of an entire set? Okay, and we want to avoid the union bound. Well, one thing that's easy to talk about is the median of the projection, okay? So when you're projecting a lot of points, um, most of them will fall within this interval, but there's bound to be some outliers, okay? Um, but for something like the median, the outlier does not affect it, okay? And so that's easy to characterize. If the set lies within a ball of radius delta, then the median will lie within a very predictable interval of size delta over square root d. The median will lie within that interval, okay? But what we need um, is we're talking about diameters. And so we need to think about what happens to the diameter of a set when you project it onto a random line. Okay, so this is this one. So you have a set S, and you project it onto a random line. What happens to the diameter of the set? Okay. Now, if the set is full dimensional, okay, something like this, and you project it onto a line, the diameter remains unchanged. Okay, but in our case, the set is not full dimensional. In our case, the set has low doubling dimension, which means that it has small covering numbers. And so the set itself cannot possibly fill up the entire ball. The set occupies just a tiny fraction of the ball, okay? because it has these small covering numbers. And therefore, one would expect its diameter to shrink dramatically upon projection. And you can show, in fact, that the diameter shrinks by a factor of d0 over d, the square root of d0 over d. Okay? So the diameter of a, sh of, the, uh, of a set of low doubling dimensions shrinks a lot when you project onto a random line, and again, in this very predictable way. Okay, and I won't go through the proof of that, but I'll just give you now the overall argument for why this, this so we started with this data structure, the KD tree, which is a very popular data structure because it's so simple. Okay, And then we notice that it really does not adapt to intrinsic dimension. Okay? But we said that, oh, you know, there's this little change you can make to it that, that, that makes it adapt to intrinsic dimension. All you need to do is instead of picking coordinate directions, pick directions at random from the unit sphere. Okay? And if you do that, then the, rate, then the diameter of cells shrinks very rapidly down the tree. Okay? The diameter of cells gets halved every d0, log d0 levels, instead of depending on the larger d. Okay? So, um, so let me just give you an overview for why that's the case. So let's say you, you're building this tree, and now you're at some point in the tree, 
And these are the points in that in your current cell. Let's say it lies within radius one, within a ball of radius one. Okay, and now what we want to show is if we keep growing this tree another d0 log d0 levels, all the cells that are at that lower point in the tree will have radius less than a half. Okay, every one of those cells will be contained in a ball of radius less than a half. So how do you show that? Well, what we do is we start with this cell and we cover it by balls of radius 1 over square root d0. And how many do we need? Not many. Because the set has low doubling dimension, it has small covering numbers. It has epsilon covers of size 1 over epsilon to the d0. And so we need just a few balls. So all the points lie within these balls. Now we look at any pair of balls that's far away from each other, that has distance more than a half from each other. And what we'll show is that these random splits, if you take a random direction and split at the median, there is a constant probability that these two balls will get cleanly separated from each other. One will go on one side and one will go on the other side. Okay, so every time you split, there's a constant probability of cleanly separating these two balls. So how many pairs of, how many pairs of balls are there that are far away from each other? Mm -hmm. Well, there are only this many balls, so the number of pairs is just d0 to the d0. And at each level, you have a constant probability of splitting any pair of them. So after d0 log d0 levels, you will end up splitting apart every pair of balls. And so in the, in the remaining cells, d0 log d0 levels below, um, you will not have points from two balls that are far away from each other. And therefore, everything will be within a radius of a half. Okay, so that's the overall argument. And um, okay, and so why why is it the case uh, that there's this constant probability of splitting these balls apart? So here are two balls that are far away from each other, distance a half, and they each have radius one over square root d zero. What happens to the radius of these balls when you when you shrink them. Well, we've seen what happens to the diameter of a set when you project onto a random line. It shrinks in a predictable way. So it's going to map to an interval of size 1 over square root d. Okay, and likewise with this ball. The distance between these is a half. And we've seen what happens to individual vectors when you project them onto a random direction. It shrinks by a factor of square root d. So the distance between these remains 1 over square root d. And you're picking a point that is the median plus noise. So there's a constant probability that the split point will lie in this middle region. Okay, so the median value will lie somewhere in this middle region, and the split point has a constant probability of lying in this middle region, and therefore cleanly separating the two balls. Okay, and that's why you get this effect that the, um, uh, that the diameter shrinks rapidly, and you get a faster rate of convergence. Okay. Okay, so, um, so what I'll talk about next is the retrieval problem, nearest neighbor search. And the interesting thing is that the same uh, trick can be used uh, to very good effect in the context of nearest neighbor, okay, which is a problem that's really been studied uh, a whole lot, okay? Um, so the nearest neighbor problem, you're given n points in d-dimensional space, and um, you need to store them in a data structure of size, of linear size, okay? Um, and later you'll get queries and you have to return the nearest neighbor of the query, okay? And what we'd like is a query time that's little O of n. Okay? What we want to avoid is doing this brute force search through all endpoints, okay? Now, if the points lie in one dimension, then we can just use binary search to get a query time of log n. Okay, and so the question has always been, what is the higher dimensional version of binary search? You know, what is it that we can do in higher dimension? And unfortunately, it really seems like there is some sort of exponential dependence on the dimension. So there are a lot of schemes out there that achieve a query time that's something like log n, but plus 2 to the d. Okay, so there's this exponential term that comes in over there. Okay, and uh, um, it's quite possible that this is inherent. Okay. Um, 
So a popular way of doing nearest neighbor search is again with a KD tree, okay? And over here, the problem changes slightly, okay? So again, you build a KD tree on the end data points. You keep going until each leaf cell contains at most, say, a thousand points. And now when you get a query, let's say your query point is over here, you move it down the tree to this cell and you return the nearest neighbor within that cell, which is this point. But the actual nearest neighbor is this point. Okay? So you have a certain chance of failing. Okay? So it's a very quick method. It's very fast. Um, what is the running time of the method? Well, the time taken to move down the tree is negligible. The running time is the time taken to look through all the points in that leaf. So if you have a thousand points, it's the time taken to look through those thousand points and find the nearest neighbor. Okay? Um, so it's very, very fast, but it has a chance of returning the wrong answer. And the curse of dimension, the way the curse of dimension comes in, is that this chance of returning the right answer drops very, very dramatically as the dimension increases. So the curse of dimension really appears in the failure probability of this method. Okay? And um, so it's an attractive method because it's so simple. And so people have been looking for, at, for ways to patch this. And, um, and so there are all sorts of schemes, like pick better directions using principal component analysis, allow the cells to overlap. But one thing that's turned out to be quite effective is to again use this idea of doing random directions. Okay? And so here's what you do. Instead of using a KD tree, again, you pick directions uniformly at random from the unit sphere. Okay? And now, instead of splitting at the median, you split at a point. You choose a percentile at random between a quarter and three quarters, between 25th percentile and 75th percentile, and you split at that point. Okay, so again, you get roughly a roughly balanced split, but it's not exactly at the median. Okay, so again, it's a random projection tree of some type. And, um, okay, so what's good about this? So what's good about this is that if you do things this way, you can very precisely characterize the failure probability of the tree. And it's not just a general upper bound you can characterize the failure probability for any specific point configuration. Okay? And this is what it is. Okay? So for any, conf any data set, x1 through xn, and for any query, the probability over the randomization in the tree <coughs> that you fail to return the right answer is proportional to this potential function that captures the difficulty of the point configuration. Okay, so some nearest neighbor problems are just harder than others. And this, let's just go through this potential function. So what it's saying is that you have your query and let's order the points by distance to the query. So x1 is the closest point, x2 is the next closest point, and so on. This potential function is the distance to the closest divided by the distance to the second closest plus the distance to the closest divided by the distance to the third closest, plus the distance to the closest divided by the distance to the fourth closest, and the whole thing divided by n. Okay? So if all the points are equidistant from the query, this is equal to 1. And it means you're out of luck. Okay? But if some points are close and the others are very far away, then this is close to 0. And so the failure probability is close to 0. Okay? And so this is something that holds um, for any data set. Okay, so it's, it's sort of nice in that way. So one of the things we'd like to understand is that, um, okay, this is a reasonable measure of the difficulty of a nearest neighbor search problem. Okay, so this, it's sort of an intuitive measure. Um, but if we have a set of low doubling dimension, what is this? You know, what does this look like? And, um, okay, so I won't go through the proofs. But it turns out that if you have a set of low doubling dimension, d0, basically it means that you get um, that this potential function can be bounded quite simply, and you get a query time, which is log n, plus d0 to the d0. Okay? So you, again, have the exponential dependence that seems to keep, up, seems to keep coming up in exact nearest neighbor search, but it's only on the intrinsic dimension. 
Okay. So um, at this point, um, so what's nice about this result is um, is that we can actually characterize the failure probability for any point configuration. This bound over here is not impressive at all, okay, in the sense that there has been a lot of work in computational geometry that give, returns the exact nearest neighbor deterministically in this amount of time, whereas this method returns the exact nearest neighbor with probability a half in this amount of time, okay? So why would one want to do something like this if you can run for the same amount of time, at least in big O notation, and get the correct answer for sure, okay? Um, and the reason is, uh, you know, is there any reason to use this? And there is, and there, and there are two reasons, and this actually works very well. So the first reason is that it's very simple, but the bigger reason is that it's randomized which means that you can make multiple copies of the tree. And this is the thing that works really well. <coughs> so instead of just having one of these trees, you have 10 of them, okay? And on any given query, the trees independently have a probability half of failing. So you run the query down every tree. Each of them returns a candidate nearest neighbor. You just return whichever of those is closest and now the probability of failure goes down from a half to 1 over 1024. Okay, so this ability to uh, randomize and repeat is really what gives the method its, uh, its strength. And this is something that, um, you know, that I think people have um, figured out just very recently. So these are some experiments. So, so the idea is to just build multiple copies of these trees and um, um, and just return the nearest out of all the results that you get from each of them, okay? And, uh, and so recently a group in, in Helsinki, who are not the originators of these methods, um, ran a comparison of a whole bunch of nearest neighbor uh, techniques, ranging from some of the methods developed in the 90s by David Mount and others, to locality sensitive hashing, to so on and so forth, and this turned out to work exceptionally well, okay? So over here is the chance of finding the, the nearest neighbor, and on the um, y-axis is the query time um, in a log scale, and the ones at the bottom are these forests of, of random projection trees, okay? And for example, locality-sensitive hashing is this line up here, this is the method of Mount et al. And then there are a few other methods, okay? So this turned out to be quite an effective paradigm. Okay, so let me just end with some open problems. So um, this method that I, I showed, the, the constructing, the tree, constructing these trees out of random projection seems, seems very effective in some settings, uh, uh, certainly in this nearest neighbor setting but it only works for Euclidean uh, distance, okay? Very often, um, the distance function we really want to work with is something that is dictated by the domain and does not coincide with L2 distance, okay? So one natural question would be that can we do something for general metric spaces? And again, such technology does seem to exist um, already, Clarkson, for example, has some very nice data structures for exact nearest neighbor search in metric spaces that has roughly the kind of time complexity I was talking about, uh, log n plus d0 to the d0. But is there something that has more of this sort of quick and dirty randomized flavor? Because if there is, that could be really very effective. Um, and so that would, be, that would be a very nice thing to be able to develop. Is there, is there sort of a metric space version of these kind of uh, random projection trees. Okay, is there, okay, so that's one question. The second question is that the notion of intrinsic dimension that we've been working with is this doubling dimension. And, um, and the reason we've been doing that is that it's just a very convenient notion that existed already in the literature and it's just very nice to work with. A lot of dimensionality notions are asymptotic uh, they really look at balls whose radius is approaching zero. Uh, 
which is not very helpful for algorithmic analysis where you typically have a finite number of points and are therefore dealing with balls of you know, considerable size. Okay, so this is a nice notion that's uniform over all sizes. Um, so it's a very nice notion, but there are types of um, structure, of low-dimensional low structure that doubling dimension does not seem to capture. For example, cluster structure, okay? And so are there, you know, you know well, what are some other nice notions of intrinsic dimensionality? Um, if we could find something a little bit more general, or, or perhaps a different notion that captures um, a whole bunch of other cases, that would be really great, okay? Because then we could try to, again, uh, do non-parametric um, estimation uh, um, that's adapt adapted to that kind of dimension, okay? So that would be another uh, really nice approach. Okay, thank you very much.